Hi guys, Rod from Bensonium Thought Videos here and this week I'm taking a break from my series on the philosophy behind the scientific method and instead thinking about an idea that is known as the prisoner's dilemma and its relationship to the Christian church. Okay, so this video will contain some thinking around the Christian faith. Therefore, if you don't like Christianity, you might want to let this video pass. So what stimulated me to make this video is the unfolding situation in the US Republican Party. For those who don't know, the Republican Party has entered a little bit of an internal civil war with itself as a senior member of the party was removed from her position of influence because she refuses to endorse the Trump lie that the 2020 election was stolen from him by the Biden campaign. However, reading different reports and watching different news segments coming out of the states, it appears that there are plenty of Republicans who secretly want their party back from Trump and his power minions, but they are simply too afraid to express this view publicly for fear of the political repercussions, being removed from important positions in the future, or being replaced by a pro-Trump candidate in what the US call the primary, where candidates jostle to go forward as the candidate who will stand for election. This scenario is of course all too familiar throughout human history. In general, many despots and wicked people are able to cling to power not because the majority support them, but because the majority are unable to coordinate their resistance and so remove the despot from power. A textbook example of this would be the terrible reign of Joseph Stalin and the shenanigans that went on immediately before his death, which are captured in the rather dark comedy, The Death of Stalin. This is well worth seeing if you haven't watched the movie yet. More formally, the inability of a majority to act in their best interest to remove a dangerous despot is also captured in a form of mathematics, which was first pioneered by the mathematician John Nash, who developed the maths of game theory, along with other major mathematical contributions. Sadly, Nash suffered from some form of paranoid schizophrenia, which led him to have delusions about a communist conspiracy. His life is also captured in the movie A Beautiful Mind, which is also well worth watching if you have not already done so. Anyway, as part of Nash's work on game theory, he developed a thought experiment called The Prisoner's Dilemma that goes as follows. Two prisoners are arrested for the crime of shoplifting and imprisoned. Each is kept in solitary confinement, so neither can ever speak to the other. One of the prisoners has also been involved in armed robbery, but the prosecution do not have enough evidence to convict either prisoner of this more serious crime, nor do they know for sure who was the one involved in the armed robbery. Therefore, the prosecutors offer both men the opportunity to testify against the other man, so that one of them can be convicted of armed robbery. The crime of shoplifting is a one-year prison sentence, while the crime for armed robbery is five years in prison. However, because only one man definitely committed the armed robbery, if both testify against each other, then it is known that at least one of them is lying, and so in this instance, the maximum sentence they will both receive is three years in prison. Each prisoner now has two options, either to remain silent or to dob their fellow prisoner in for the crime of armed robbery. Now, if they both remain silent, then they both will only get one year in prison for shoplifting. If one prisoner testifies against the other prisoner, then he will be set free for cooperating, while the prisoner who remains silent will go to prison for five years for armed robbery. Finally, if both prisoners testify against each other, then both will get a three-year prison sentence. The logic table showing the various possibilities and outcomes is now shown on the screen next to me. So what is the most likely outcome? Well, of course, it is both prisoners testifying against each other, even though if they both remain silent, they would each only receive a sentence of one year. The problem is they cannot risk remaining silent because if their counterpart decides to testify, then they will end up with a five rather than a three year sentence. So although a one year sentence is technically in both their interests, 
they will end up both accusing the other of armed robbery so that neither gets lumbered with a five-year sentence. It is this dilemma that also captures nicely why evil regimes are so hard to remove from power, even if a majority of people want them gone. The problem is simply that those who have the power to remove a wicked regime must be able to trust that their companions will all act to do so. If only a small number decide to continue to support the regime for their own self-preservation or even their betterment, then the ones who stick their necks out to remove the tyrant will almost certainly face dire consequences, most likely death. Now another fascinating observation of human history is how despotic regimes generally are very hostile to Christianity and the Christian church. This at first might seem surprising given that the founder of Christianity, Jesus of Nazareth, preached a gospel of non-violence, peace and love. However, with a little further thought, it becomes perhaps more obvious why despots might fear the church, and that is Christ's teaching, when taken seriously, breaks the power of the prisoner's dilemma. Jesus' teaching was very much focused on standing for the truth, no matter what the personal consequence. Now, while it is true that many Christians might fail such an arduous test, it is also true that many believers down the centuries have stood up against despotic regimes and pay the ultimate price for their faithfulness. The important point is that while most of the time such heroic actions will usually just add to the number of Christian martyrs, it also opens the possibility that a full-scale peaceful rebellion against a tyrant may just be enough to tip the balance and lead to the overall downfall. Hence, perhaps, why tyrants in general are so hostile to the authentic Christian faith. As I have thought about these things, it also reminded me of a conversation I had when I was in my early 20s with another youth leader about the idea of always testifying for God, even if it cost you your life. At that time, I was an idealistic young man who saw no problem with bravely standing up for what is true and right. But my older companion challenged me on this, arguing that surely sometimes self-preservation is completely valid, especially if the person who is threatening to take your life is simply a madman. At the time, I could not develop a good argument against his rather pragmatic stance. However, I do feel that the possible breaking of the prisoner's dilemma may be at least one such argument, even if it can only be applied in particular circumstances. Admittedly, one can still debate the issue if it is just some random nutter who comes up to you on the street pointing a gun saying, deny Christ or I'll kill you, rather than the encompassing power of an evil regime. However, before I bring this thought to a close, I must now address the obvious elephant in the room, and that is my whole argument began by thinking about the current problems in the US Republican Party and having to extract themselves from Donald Trump and his cult of followers. I have argued that the reason Trump still holds the Republican Party in his grip is because many Republicans are too afraid to stick their necks out and reject Trump's influence for fear of the negative consequences that will befall them if they do. Yet, of course, many of these individuals who are behaving like this call themselves born-again evangelical Christians. Therefore, isn't it really Christianity that is causing the problem here? Well, my response to this is to argue that the fact these individuals are unable to extricate themselves at all from the prisoner's dilemma is just one more piece of evidence that the type of Christianity that gave rise to Trump in the first place is not the authentic article. Now, in saying this, I am not suggesting that every person who self-identifies as a Christian and supports Trump's toxic brand of politics is not a Christian. What I am saying is the theology that underpins this type of Christianity is deeply flawed, in a similar way to the faulty expressions of Christianity in the early church, which drew such harsh admonishment from the Apostle Paul, as he once wrote, You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? When the Apostle was battling against the Judaizers and the Gnostics, he did not see everyone who had fallen into these bad sects as fully culpable, 
but rather blamed the ringleaders while pleading with their followers to see sense. It is rather instructive to note that at least one of these major early Christian heresies was based on the early church failing to reevaluate the Old Testament law in the light of what Jesus had achieved by dying on the cross for the sins of humanity. In many ways, I think the type of toxic US evangelicalism, which is leading to such sub-Christian behavior, shares the same root problem as experienced by the first century church of not fully moving away from an Old Testament understanding of how God is working in the world. Many Trump supporting evangelicals embrace the Old Testament idea that while Trump may be far from Christian, he is being used by God to protect them from any unpleasant suffering that might arise as they deal with either hard left liberal ideology or sometimes new atheism, which often intrinsically is more hostile to the Christian faith. Protagonists of this idea see Trump as another King Cyrus, who was used by God to return the Jewish exiles from Babylon around 539 BC. Yet the desire of Christians to use earthly political power to establish their own desires is an anathema to the teachings of Christ, who supremely demonstrated to his followers that the kingdom of God will be established through the love of one's enemies and faithfulness of his followers, even in the midst of persecution by those who hate the church and want to silence what it stands for. It is a strange historical fact that the more the church adheres to bravely standing for the truth, despite the negative consequences, the more powerful it becomes, even while it may mean many individual Christians suffer for the authenticity of their faith. As the saying goes, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Okay, so that is my thought video for this week. If you like this video, please do hit the like key. And if you want to see more of my content, then please do subscribe to my channel by hitting the subscribe button and the bell notification key below. Until next time, I hope your body and mind are in a good place. And bye for now.